In this video, Dr. Stephen Porges and Dr. Sue Carter talk about a variety of interesting subjects in terms of recovery and the human person. They explain how we must move from disembodied to embodied creatures, how we must recruit our nervous system as a healing collaborator, how we must allow our body feelings to be the motivator in our lives, the effects of oxytocin on the muscles, nerves, and brain, the tremor mechanism in TRE as a way of walking backwards in our evolutionary experience, a sense of love and feelings of giving and receiving love are more powerful than any known medicine, and many other additional subjects of interest and creative thinking for our future understanding of how to work with trauma in the human person. Um, the story that I would love to hear and would love to respond to in, a, in this dialogue is really, uh, where did you come up with TRE? The essential element in me understanding this tremor mechanism in, in, that I ended up creating as trauma-releasing exercises, I was living in the Middle East and I was living in countries at war. And there was mm -hmm. one moment of many moments where we were in a bomb shelter and I had two children on my lap and they were about two years old. And these two young children were just tremoring in their bodies out of terror. And I could feel, because my hands were on their back. They were facing each other, sitting on my lap. I put my hands on their back. And they were tremoring out of terror. And I could feel it in my hands. Now, I knew this tremoring of terror, because I've had the experience myself as well. But what interested me was when I looked around the bomb shelter, there were other small children. And they were all tremoring. And they were all terrified. But when we got to about the age of 11, 12, and 13, I could see they were just as frightened, but they were trying to inhibit or hold back wow. the tremoring. And so I saw them trying to do that. And then none of the adults were tremoring. Yeah. yeah. And so after the, um, after the episode was over, and we left the bomb shelter. I said, do you tremor? I asked the adults, do you tremor like the children tremor when you're afraid? And the answer was perfect. He said, oh, no, we don't tremor like that because we don't want the children to think we're afraid. And right there, it sort of dawned on me. It's kind of like crying. A two-year-old, when they fall down, they'll cry freely. Yeah. An 11-year-old, when they fall down, they're embarrassed to cry. So they inhibit crying because it makes them look weak or vulnerable. And by <laughs> the time we're adults, we don't even cry anymore. We've learned how to actually control natural mm. mechanisms in our organism mm -hmm. and tremoring was one of those mechanisms that i thought if we had done this freely as children would we have mm. been able to constantly reduce mm. that overexcited charge in our nervous system throughout all yeah. of life and so that's when i started to try to figure out can i can i induce the tremor mechanism and have the same physiological and psycho-emotional results post-trauma mm. if I do it safely with a client in my office. And I discovered I could develop the exercise routine that evokes the tremor mechanism in five minutes. And as long as the safety is established with the client, they can mm -hmm. tremor out old traumas from the past that are still stuck physiological in, physiologically in their structure. And it mm -hmm. seems to reduce the tension patterns in the body yeah. so it restores healthier functioning and i think what it does is it it increases um the um the immune system because it reduces stress and so by increasing the immune system i think that's why they're saying wow i've gotten rid of this or it helped me with this problem yeah. or i can sleep at night I think all of it is because we reduce stress levels in the structure, which increases the capacity of the immune system. Okay, this is a good starting point, David, because I would deconstruct that and retranslate what you said and say that as we get older, we inhibit these more primitive processes in our nervous system. And in a way, we become dissociative creatures, become disembodied. And what you're doing is saying you're re-embodying the person through these more primitive experiences because they are more linked to subcortical and brainstem areas. And then when those responses occur, they create the platform, the neural platform. And this is now using polyvagal terminology. 
they provide the neural platform for a different perspective or different neuroception, different bias of the world. And, but, it, but it becomes now a very nice theme of saying, what is one of the major developmental processes that we, we, uh, we go through? And that is not feeling our body. We learn not to feel our body. We learn to reject that because we're told as students, sit still, pay attention, or don't allow your bodily feelings to be the motivator in your life. And what you're saying is when we're doing that, we are getting some advantages because we are in a sense doing all this cognitive and this hard work. But we're also having massive disadvantages because we're turning off the feedback loops in our body. And we have all these comorbidities now, which means that our, our neuro, nervous system is no longer managing the organs. Our organs are now vulnerable. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm going to extend a little bit more that question, then I'll do the same with you, Sue. Can you explain how you'd like to tie in more solidly your polyvagal theory, which we really yeah. um, teach and support so much, with our if you can, the tremor mechanism, or at least body work? Well, it's easy to link it with body work because everything is about, is your body uh, safe enough to be touched? Are you accessible? And actually this goes back to earlier discussions that I used to say that really, uh, you remember the theme is that you can do anything you want because they love you. And, and so they can go into the, literally the pits of hell and that becomes an experience that they can feel and go through because your loving support is there for them. And so they can have these visceral feelings, mm -hmm. which may have been associated with horrible things, and they pass through it with tears in their eyes, but with tears of joy at the end. So the, the issue really is um, what TRE is about. It's about, people, about moving people through different physiological states. And when they move through those different physiological states, there's association of feelings and thoughts that go with that. So it's like we're in certain physiological states. Those are neural platforms for emergent experiences. And you're bringing them down to this very primitive one of really life threat, uh, going into this immobilization of inability to move. It's not life threat in the sense where a person passes out or goes into uh, uh, defecates on the spot. But it's the point before, it's when they go into a freeze, which is they can't move, but their body is still maintaining a tremendous amount of sympathetic tone. So they're basically fighting within themselves. You have the sympathetic tone of massive mobilization, but you now have the dorsal vagal circuit that says, stay put, because you're now moving into that level. And you're allowing them to literally get out of the, out of the, uh, out of the cavern, out of the the, the uh, uh, abyss, you're, you're helping them out. And I think they're actually almost describing that to you as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's absolutely true. They, they can almost describe, if they yeah. knew what the polyvagal theory was, they could actually describe themselves yeah. coming out of freeze, going into that excited charge and then re release. Becoming in the excited charge leads to an awareness with exuberance, so they, they in a sense start reframing the ex, the mobilization from a fight flight to now this is exuberance and this energy can now be contained and focused. Yeah, great, thank you very much. <laughs> Sue, what do you wanna say about that same thing, about what it is you were planning to present from your um, concepts of trauma? How would, it, would, how would it tie in with what we do? It's probably easiest for me to explain what I do in terms of evolution. Um, the mammal, the human mammal evolved with a very uh, well-regulated social nervous system. Uh, that nervous system takes advantage of a hormone known as oxytocin. Oxytocin allows us to have a strategy of using other to calm us, to make us feel safe. So I often say that oxytocin is a metaphor for safety, a biological metaphor for safety. Oxytocin is a modern solution 
to a very old problem, which is the problem of survival and then reproduction. Survival is the place I think that people go when they're most frightened. They go into survival modes. And it's my guess that your methodology, your trimmer methodology, is sort of walking through this evolutionary, backward through this evolutionary experience. Um, there's also, unfortunately, as far as I know, no one's done any of the kinds of research that I do with your, with your paradigm, but it's a perfect one for studying this because you know when the change occurs. So many kinds of therapy are very slow and problematic and a lot of times they go the opposite direction and instead of people feeling more safe, they feel more frightened, they re relive bad experiences over some undetermined period of time. So the idea of bringing the body into the question of fear and trauma is profound and really it's quite brilliant to take um, a naturally occurring mechanism like tremor, which you can define very, very well, and, but which is safe biologically. It's not, you're not harming people by doing this. And you can then let them experience that in a safe environment and then bring them slowly back into a place where they feel more control of their own bodies, I hope. So I think there's, a, there's probably a very big kind of hormonal story right under the surface of, of your procedures. And it would be extremely exciting to do the actual research, but we can, in the presentation that we'll do for your group, we'll give you the kind of background, and I hope I can dissect that phenomenon with you, and we'll see if it doesn't fit rather nicely into this evolutionary perspective, which is you go from a really, really simple system that depends on one individual to a system that then brings on board the parts of the nervous system that are necessary for sociality. So even if you're not in a social environment, you're still activating the part of the nervous system that allows us to feel safe in social, social situations. So it's, it's a bit complicated, but the whole idea is we have a very, very simple problem to solve, and that's survival. And our body has multiple solutions. And you've found one way to use one of those to help the person kind of re-experience, go from being in a survival mode to being in a situation where their nervous system knows that it's going to be all right, that it is safe. So I'm going to add on to what Sue said briefly, and that is, if you see when a person goes to TRE, if at the end of their tremor, when they come out of it, if they become spontaneously social at that moment, they want to engage someone, you really are basically showing the script of what Sue was talking about. And you're showing the script of what polyvagal theory talks about, which is moving up various stages of autonomic regulation that parallels the vertebrate evolution of the autonomic nervous system into what we are as mammals. Can either of you speak a little bit about what that tremor mechanism is, how it works, and why you see it working in your concepts? Well, let me start by redefining what you're describing. So you're describing a violation of expectancy. I mean, that's what you defined, you know, a massive violation of expectancy. And our nervous system treats violation of expectancy as threat. It's a, it's a neural, un, un, that uncertainty 
is uncomfortable for our nervous system. That's what's going on with the pandemic. It's not the pandemic. It's, the, uh, it's that neural violation of expectancy, especially with the messaging. If the messaging were consistent, then the expectancy would be very structured and we would know what we would have to do. So if I win the lotto or if I win something, you know, some, a slot, or if I, you know, just out of the realm of my expectation, that is threatening to my nervous system. Now, our culture may say this is a wonderful gift, but the nervous system says, I can't really handle this. And that's what the people are telling you. I have to sit down. I can't handle this. Wow, thank you. Sue, so, what well, would you and We can follow what Steve said about expectancy. There's some fairly recent research with oxytocin that shows in animals, and based on very specific brain circuits, that oxytocin switches um, individuals from a sense of threat to a sense of safety. And I think that's what sociality does. And that's probably what your, what your TRE does. It allows you, again, to do this, have these feelings in a safe environment. My guess is that that same experience is very different if the person's alone. It may not be therapeutic if they're alone. But if they're with someone who's trained to be their support, then it becomes um, a switch, possibly based on oxytocin being released, which it almost certainly is by an experience like the one you're describing. I could, at some point, if you'd like, uh, take you through the bits and pieces, the effects of oxytocin on muscles, the effect of oxytocin on nerves, and of course, on the brain. So we have ancient systems, and I think you are eliciting those ancient systems. Um, and then we have modern solutions to that problem. And the modern solutions are ones that involve the central nervous system rather than the spinal cord. They involve using others rather than doing it alone. And so we start to see a way of evolving to situations which we humans might call love, where we feel the safety of love, that kind of compassionate love, where you know there's someone else there and that someone can save you if you are in deep trouble. Yeah, David, I have a paper called Love as Embodied Medicine. That might, it's open access. It was done uh, for the European Association of Body Therapists. And it's short and it's written at a, I tried to make it pretty general. So I can share that with you. The underlying basis of being a human, a social mammal being, a, hu a human being a social mammal, is that our uh, imperative in life is to be connected and to be a co-regulator of others. And so as you get the person more embodied, and when they have shift autonomic state, and when they get uh, the release of oxytocin, they are better co-regulators, they're more accessible and less vulnerable. Uh, and another point is they, they shift their bias. The world becomes beautiful as opposed to the world becomes uncertain and frightening. So there's a whole shift in how they see the world. And that shift is, in my modeling, is really uh, so greatly dependent upon your, the physiological state that you're in. And this leads me to another question or a suggestion is that we have body awareness, uh, we have a body perception questionnaire, which really gives you information about the autonomic state that the person perceives themselves to be in. And in the research that we're conducting now, we're showing that uh, childhood adversity or uh, trauma experiences, of course, impact on a variety of outcomes, but they seem to 
being mediated by the physiological state that the person perceives themselves to be in. So if you covary out that subjective view of your physiology, adversity, meaning ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, and other trauma type measures don't seem to be carrying the variance of the outcome because it's being mediated by whether the experience was literally felt in the body. We're using it now in the study uh, to evaluate the effect of trauma history on responses to the virus, to COVID-19. And what we're getting is really the variance is being accounted for by their subjective reports of the physiological state. So we don't know, uh, uh, you know, so it's a mediating variable. And if you take away that physiological source of variance, adversity plays a minor role. And, and we also have plots showing that the degree of severity has a linear impact on the subjective autonomic reactivity. There's always this thing going on in the medical realm about cognitive behavioral therapy, which is mostly the psycho-emotional state, neurological implications yeah. about trauma, and then physiological implications. Yeah. How, how can we blend those together as becoming a big oh. issue? Well, I, I, it's a big issue to someone. It's not a big issue to me um, because there's a, there's a clarity in my mind. They do different things and they should be used for different types of problems. But we have created what, what, I, what we call the Traumatic Stress Research Consortium. And Sue was the former director of the Kinsey Institute in Indiana. And I founded this consortium. And our first task was to find out really about trauma therapists. What were their experiences? Uh, what were their trauma histories? But above that, what practices did they think worked well with people who had trauma? And this is your question. So we have measures of uh, benefit rated by these individuals and prevalence, how, how often are they used? So with the trauma community, many of the trauma therapists, many of them have been trained in CBT but the effect of this on trauma is far to the left, meaning it's not very effective. But the somatic therapies are biased to the right, being very beneficial. And there's also, we had on it whether the therapists view themselves as polyvagal informed, and that went right up to the, to the, literally to the top, even though that's not a therapy, but it's really saying if, they, if the trauma informed therapist had this neurophysiological orientation, it made sense. The other important thing we've found, and we've gotten several interesting important things, but most of the therapists, the median number, the median number of trainings of specialty practices like uh, CBT that trauma therapists had was eight. So you don't have uniquely a CBT therapist. You might have a CBT TRE therapist in there. And so what the therapists are telling you is they're looking for toolkits and they're really not biased to anyone. They want to do things that work well and they are telling me what's working well. It's a real interesting story. The other part of the story is we found out uh, in a sense the prevalence of trauma histories in trauma therapists, which was one of the underlying questions. And the idea was that they would have a passion to help people at trauma. They would be uh, more understanding well, the number is about twice that of the population. So it's somewhere between 40 and 50% have a trauma history. And I thought that was an underestimate of the number because you know I spend a lot of time within the trauma community and virtually all the people that I interact with have some type of history. They are healing themselves through this to be helpful to others. And you start, we start asking these questions, why are you doing this? Is there a financial gain? And, you know, financial gain is way down. It's really, it's a, it's a person to person role of trying to optimize the human experience. Thank you so much. Um, Sue, I want to come back to you just because I want to go back to the, the book that you talked about or the article that you published regarding love. Yeah. Um, the paper I wrote, which is called uh, love as embodied medicine goes through the evidence for which there's a great deal that a sense of love and feelings of both giving and receiving love are more powerful than any known medicine. 
that including for things like heart disease and cancer. And this has been shown by epidemiological methods, but those methods don't allow you to say what the process is. The process is almost certainly, of course, in the body. And it relates to the fact that these old hormones that I study activate the autonomic nervous system. They regulate it. They tie the nerves to chemical processes throughout the body and throughout the brain. And I have provided the background for that in that little article. Um, it's, to my eye, the amount of evidence we have for the healing power of love is pretty astonishing. It's, it's overwhelming. Yet it remains, so it's a cliche. But in truth, it is an explanation. And as you understand it, you are empowered by the fact that you know something about what your body's experiencing. Since our, our cortex was put on last in the evolution of the nervous system, we get information indirectly. We can't, the most things we can't tell our body what to do. We can't will away diseases, but we can manage them by using this beautiful nervous system to help us understand what's happening to us and to take away the fear. Fear is primitive, love is modern. It's actually a modern invention that probably only mammals have. So I would even broaden that and I would talk about compassion as a biological treatment. And I'm actually working with a, uh, a, a company that has clinics and we're designing what I call a, a polyvagal form clinical navigator, which is to shift the paradigm of medicine out of the realm of chronic uh, assessment and evaluation, because that means that you're being evaluated, which triggers defense in your nervous system. Mm -hmm. So going in for medical uh, evaluation is not a positive experience. So I want to shift it into a compassionate experience of a shared journey of knowledge of learning about the body. And that means that assessment provides us with information to learn about who we are. It's the empowerment. And the other metaphor that I use is that the job of a physician or a medical care provider is to recruit the patient's nervous system as a collaborator which means you don't scare it. Yeah, and this is really what Sue is talking about with love. What, are, what is love as medicine? Love is recruiting the other's nervous system as a collaborator on a journey of health and healing. Wow, that's very powerful. Thank you so much. That's really quite good. Now, given what we've just said, for both of you, what do you think is the future? How, how should humans, or will we move in the future for resolving or integrating traumatic experiences? How are we gonna do this better? I would really say after kind of traversing uh, many disciplines over decades and being around uh, cl the clinical world as well as the academic research world, there's one thing I've learned and that is to be patient. I think there's an awful lot of knowledge there. We have an understanding. We, we, in a way, we have all the pieces and we have an understanding of what our bodies need. But we don't have a culture that supports that understanding. And the reason our culture doesn't support that understanding is that our institutes are run by people who are basically disembodied and traumatized individuals. So you have this whole paradoxical situation going on and you can see it in real time that if you're if you're disembodied if you're a dissociated type of person you're basically creating a narrative that's being judgmental and evaluative of everyone without having enough sense to be reflected and feel your own see who you really are so we are not connected enough but we know through the history of humanity and the history of other mammalian species that connection 
is really our biological imperative. And so we need to be that way. And we can see it in our day-to-day -day lives, the basically the tribalism, the marginalization of others. And these are really major issues occurring in our society. And so that's really great. So in one sense, if we're talking about the future, as I understand it, you're saying if we reduce reduce fear, increase love or compassion, we have to be embodied to do it. And yeah. if we are embodied with the, those principles in mind, we will create the new way of healing trauma. Right, well, be, it, these are the emerging properties. So when you're compassionate, you're a witness, you witness effectively other people, meaning that you enable them to feel safe. Their feelings of safety enable their bodies to do the healing. So the whole notion of whether it's mental or physical health, it's really endogenous. It's within our, in our body. And if our body sees uh, the environment as being rejective or evaluative, it's the same thing. We get into states of defense, and then we can't even heal our injuries to our organs. Uh, so part of the problem is that uh, is that in terms of medicine, we see body uh, different than mind. And really, there should be no, so there should be nothing, uh, it should have a distinction between psychiatry and internal medicine. And they both haven't learned enough. Both are not, in a sense, neurally informed. They're still dealing with phenomena. And when we talk about internal medicine, and we all go to physicians, and we really th are thankful they're there, but their knowledge base is extraordinarily limited. And so their treatment is that of an organ disorder, when in reality, the organ disorder is the last stage of the pathology. You have a neural dysfunction of regulation of that organ, which is the adaptive reaction to what you were earlier calling stressors, where your body is now kind of reacting to immediate threat. And the issue is that we go, we're good to deal with immediate threat. We had this really, very little prolonged damage because we then would recover and become safe. But the culture that we all live in doesn't allow that recovery to occur. We don't respect the co-regulation phase. Think about uh, elementary school or, or, or grade school or high school. How much time is spent allowing the kids to re-regulate their physiology through play and social interaction? That's being removed. How much time in our lives has been, uh, we didn't take to socialize, to feel good and spend time with others because we felt we had to produce something for someone else or we need to get somewhere in our lives to leverage it so we could do what we really wanted to do. So the issue is the culture doesn't really understand the human being as a resource. In 1949, Walter Hess got the Nobel Prize for his research uh, documenting that the brain regulated visceral organs. Okay, meaning that mental states, uh, neurophysiology of the brain could change all your physiology. And so it really means that top-down diseases were, could impact on your organs, but also meant that bottom-up uh, disorders could affect our mental processes. How well is that understood in contemporary medicine today? It's not. And in fact, the opening sentence of his Nobel Prize speech really goes on about how from the earliest of times, everything was everyone knew that everything was connected to everything else, that older systems impacted on newer systems and newer on older. It's a unity of, of connection within the body. But what we're really learning, and a lot of this uh, is actually I learned from Sue, is we're not really uh, systems in our body, we're also systems out of our body. So the, dia the, the emphasis that I now use about co-regulation and connectedness as a biological imperative really uh, basically is derivative from what I learned from Sue, and that is we're not uh, isolates. Our nervous systems need other to, to regulate, and we need to respect that. Yet our society says self-regulate. He yells at kids to self-regulate. And the irony or the paradox, whatever terminology you want to use, is that those who have opportunities for co-regulation become the best self-regulators. They become the boldest, the most creative ones because they have 
they've had the resource of having the least memories of feeling safe with another. That's great. Thank you so much. I, I really like that a lot. Um, Sue, I'm going to ask you one last question, and I asked Stephen about it before uh, you left. So my question for you is, imagine our future as a species. How are we as a planet, as a human species, what would our, what would our trauma recovery or our trauma integration processes look like in the future? What do we have to do to sort of get this? that the human species will be traumatized, will experience these, but we can survive and even potentially grow from them. Well, I think we're going through that right now. We're seeing it in the, um, the pan epidemic. Um, in fact, it's extremely clear if we interact with each other in a positive way and we take the needs of others into account we do better and they do better the next level the future we can only hope that this big brain will allow us to take some of that information and use it to inform our behavior so we don't have to wait until we're sick to deal with our problems, but we don't have to wait till the planet's sick. We can incorporate this into the future. You, you have to feel safe to think about the future. Children who've been traumatized probably are not very future-oriented. They're living in the moment, in the survival of the moment. As soon as we understand the benefits of that, whether that understanding is a body lesson or a psychological lesson or both, then we will be able to move forward at a much faster rate. Our understanding of the body, our understanding of our nervous system, all of that is less than one century old. So we have, um, we have the opportunity to learn from our experiences and to make those ex it, let those experiences inform us so that we don't waste time and energy on things that don't matter, which are mostly defensive kinds of experiences and behaviors. Well, I have something for you personally, since I heard that wonderful interview that you did with Steve probably a year or so ago, which I think was a huge success and a big hit in the sense that people are looking for the answers to the kinds of questions that you brought up with Steve. And I, I've been thinking about this and I'm fairly certain that in our evolutionary history as a species, we have, by the time we got to the human condition, we actually have a novel solution to life's two big issues. One is birth and the other is death. People are very much afraid of death. That's what religion is all about, I think. And both of those, I think, are experiences during which the body goes through physiological shifts in the case of birth on the part of the baby. It's to go from being an animal, a creature that lives in water in utero to being on dry land. And then in the case of death, it's losing oxygen again and losing independent, being an independent entity. So our molecules are still there, but something else is missing. But oxytocin is almost certainly the, the natural solution to both of those situations. We know it causes birth. We know it's there. And if you have oxytocin, it allows that transition to be much more successful. But what we don't know is about the end of life. And I think those are the questions that are really on people's minds as they get older. What's going to happen next? Where do I go? Am I just a particle or am I something more complex? And I think oxytocin is 
is an evolved mechanism for allowing us not to fear death. So people who've had near-death experiences will often report that they lost their fear of death. And I think this is part of what spirituality is about. It's trying to help others through to that sort of that transition. But I think oxytocin is right in the middle of that, of both of those experiences. Yeah, that, that's beautiful. I, I don't know as obviously as much about oxytocin as you do, but I'm convinced that the human organism itself has the capacity to assist itself to make this natural transition that we call death. And it has the chemicals, the neural pathways. That's why many people can die peacefully if their system is, is allowed to produce what it naturally would to assist this transition process. Right, that's what I think too. And I think I know at least one of the molecules, this ancient hormone, oxytocin, but if you expose humans or animals to extreme stress, they will release massive amounts of oxytocin. The difficulty with stress is it comes in two forms, acute and chronic. And the chronic form is physiologically different and much more difficult to deal with. So it's the acute experience of, of no longer breathing um, that I think oxytocin is particularly good at helping us experience. If we could do a study of people who tremor, would we be able to chart their oxytocin levels to see how it may be assisting yeah. or active? It's a good study because, as I mentioned earlier, most of the things that people want to use to release oxytocin don't have clear cut behavioral characteristics. But if you can predict the path of this, and we can take oxytocin out of blood, which would be easier actually in this case, or we can take it out of saliva. But I'm always looking for an opportunity to find something that has a really clear behavioral phenotype or set of characteristics because then we can say, well, if it works, it works. I'm betting you that we could predict based on their baseline oxytocin, who will most quickly go through the experience and also the body awareness kinds of questionnaires that Steve does would probably be a very, very good way. We haven't done this before. Uh, the part though, let's, what you're talking about is if the environment is locked into a type of anxiety or, for instance, uh, fear, it, it's disembodied. It can't connect to others. It can't do planning. And uh, when I wrote that little book called Conversations with Shiva, it was really the respect of these various phases. Yeah, that's because, what I'm again, what David's doing with, with TRE is so much faster yeah. than the typical therapeutic approaches and such so much clearer when it starts and ends. Thank okay, David, so good, to see, good to see you. Thank you, Stephen. I really appreciate it. I always enjoy talking to you. And, and we brought Sue into the group, which is great. Yeah, and, uh, I'm excited by that, too. Thank, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 bye.